here we are. We're back at the uh, our, our webinar series on complexity, um, reaching out around the world. Uh, st we started out with a beautiful uh, embassy between Wales and Aboriginal Australia, and tonight uh, Pup was coming into the mix with uh, with with Merv Wilkinson. Um, it was really good to see him again, and of course we've got the wonderful Beth Smith. Um, trying to sort of uh, you know keep things nice for us here and uh, hopefully she'll get a chance to talk for 30 seconds this time uh, because Dave Snowden's here and he likes to talk a bit and I'm here and we tend to sword fight a little bit um, as some sort of males of the species do ah, so um, I'm Tyson Yakuporta uh, I belong to the Upledge clan in far north Queensland in Australia and I wrote a book once um, that people liked. And we've got uh, Beth, you want to kick off, uh, introduce yourself here, and then we'll get rolling. Yeah, I'm Corrida. Good morning. Um, I'm Beth. I'm from Wales. And uh, if you don't recall from last time, I, I make the distinction between being from, from South Wales um, as opposed to Dave, who is uh, a North Walesian. So, Dave, over to you. Yeah, I, I have a confused identity, which is relevant to what we talk of. Yeah, I, I grew up in North East Wales, which means everybody in North West Wales thinks I'm a Liverpudlian and everybody in South Wales thinks I'm a dog. But my mother took me back to Cardiff every holiday, so I thought I was a South Walesian, even though I lived in the North. So these confused identities are a part of growing up. Um, either way, Dave Snowden, yeah, I'm also Welsh, yeah, with a confused identity. Um, I created the Canavian Framework and Cognitive Edge, and you know, other stuff will come out as we go through. I tell you what, the lateral violence amongst the Welsh is just terrible. All these ancient tribal conflicts that we got going on. Um, maybe well, one day is all, every, you'll, every, the, the, pro, the progress will sort you out. No, um, every time the English invaded, they had more Welsh troops fighting for them than English troops because they used princely fights. That's destroy. it. Now they conquered India as well. Unlike uh, Papua uh, New Guinea, which actually has the the, the densest, the most dense uh, um, linguistic diversity on the planet, uh, which would indicate that um, that traditionally for thousands of years there uh, there probably wasn't a lot of uh, large scale warfare and imperialism there because um, otherwise you'd have one or two languages on that island rather than more languages than anywhere else on the planet and so coming out of that um that beautiful place uh with some of the world's oldest agriculture um and yes actual agriculture not uh not contested agriculture <laughs> not maybe it's agriculture maybe it isn't yes agriculture be like pre-pyramids uh we have mervyn wilkinson who is um a champion merv yeah. Introduce yourself better than I just did. Oh, I, can, I, I don't think I can keep up with that, Tyson. But uh, thank you. And, th and it's great to be part of this uh, great team, esteemed team. So I'm honored. Um, yeah, we have, I, I, I have a younger, younger sister, cousin in Dalciana, Samari Brash, who I was hoping would be on. She is um, uh, untowardly delayed there, but uh, she would be able to give you the, the data in terms of how many languages, probably upwards of 800, and uh, how many tribal uh, societies, uh, probably upwards of 800 as well, Tyson and everyone listening in. So yeah, very ancient, very, very ancient and quite, uh, quite complex. So I'm Merv Wilkinson. Uh, I'm a bit like Dave, a uh, uh, confused or a complex uh, racial mix of uh, English. Your opposition there, Dave and Beth, just across there, the, the English, uh, not far away fr from you. And uh, also Irish, Malay, and of course, Papuan. So that's me and happy to be here. Beautiful. Um, I'm also happy to be here in my house uh, right now, I tell you, I really love COVID. It's um, 
it's it's really good I, I, I'm sick of doing all these in-person events that just like really take it out of you um, but I can just eat a pancake and then come and sit down at the computer it's deadly and I get to talk to Dave Snowden I get to talk to Mavin Wilkinson and Beth Smith live it's beautiful um, so we're going to try and do a mashup today of topics that usually don't go together very well because that's how we do in complexity we're all polymaths here we're gonna make it all fit together um, so we're gonna look at um, I think we're gonna look at some issues of identity and um, and then see what kind of light that sheds on uh, we'll, we'll do some economics is everybody up for economics today Oh, look at the history of money and maybe and uh, maybe we won't do the usual thing of going right back to the beginning if we do like five minutes tops and then we'll uh, you know we'll come through and um, uh, see what kind of things we can we can cook up together now um, so I'm gonna kick off uh, I think I'm, I'm gonna do a bit of Welsh face just to see how that flies and and then we'll discuss if I don't get cancelled for that in the next 30 seconds then 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 we'll ask ourselves the question of why um, so Dave if you were to uh, do an impression of me that was sort of something like um, my boomerang won't come back or something like that um, that that would uh, that would pretty be much pretty much be the end of you I think that you'd be finished however um, in our last sort of meeting offline uh, we were wondering why it's okay for me to go like I don't know um, last night Lord Baden Powell visited me in spirit world my fun way he said my fun why so how does that make you feel Dave and Beth and um, why is it all right for me to do that and it's not all right for you to do an impression of me to be honest all right although if the first person who occurs to you is baden powell you have my deepest sympathies <laughs> um i mean it's interesting there was a there's a bbc radio comedy called dead ringers um which is meant to be a satire but certainly they went out to destroy the leader of the welsh nationalist party by exaggerating a welsh valley's accent to make it foolish Right. And I think you see the same with Irish accents. So the way that you see the English use Welsh and Scotch Irish accents is really to generate, to make them, oh, these are really quaint rural people who we, you know, we look after them because they need to be looked after. So I, I do think it's actually increasingly negative. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a type, it's another type of appropriation, but Beth may feel different. Yeah. Um, I, I rate this, I think in, in our informal chat before, um, have you ever seen a TV portrayal of a Welsh person who's actually smart or educated? Yeah. Um, and, 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 and Lloyd George. And, yeah, yeah, Anthony Hopkins yeah. played one once. Lloyd George. Lloyd George and, he, and we still produce the best Shakespearean artists. And we also, interestingly, Wales has the highest proportion of elite opera singers in the world per head of population. But, but you never they, see that. They, they will always perform in an English accent. Um, yeah, Anthony that's Hopkins, it. whenever you see him winning his Golden Globes and whatever else he's yeah. doing, he's performing in an English accent. But he played that poet once. I can't remember. One of your poets. He played that role and he did the accent. Yeah, Dylan Thomas. Dylan Thomas. Yeah, and right. Dylan Thomas. The, the form of Dylan Thomas's poetry is distinctly Welsh. He just throws words together to create poetry. You know, concept of you know Bible black, for example. So that that sort of alliterative thing. You know, Cather Idris, Tempest Torm, Finn Simmons, Clan and Glory. The, these are phrases which are designed to give meaning by the tone of the way they're said. Yeah. Um, and it's quite interesting, if you look at Welsh, the first letter of every noun changes according to the word that comes before it. And what that means is a sentence can be sung as a word. So if you hear a native Welsh speaker, it's almost impossible to give up with them. They're going so quickly. So I think this question of tone of voice is actually quite important to Welsh identity. So if it's and, mocked, and, it's actually, it's anything worse. Yeah. Maybe and that's it, why the British hate you, because they had to, uh, you know, they didn't get English to just change devices. words to make them fit with the poetic devices. English, uh, they, they had to British, solve British it like a puzzle. With, with some of the lateral kind of infighting here is, is that a Welsh accent can vary between two miles yeah. down the road. 
right. based upon somebody's intonation or the way they'll say one particular word, you can almost locate them to a, a particular village. Yeah, right. tattoos being a great one. Tattoos is different depending on where you are in the world. So, yeah, Merv, so I, I, Mervyn, what do you think I, is the factor here in, um, in, in, in why my incredibly offensive Welsh face um, is okay? Well, let me come at it from a Papuan perspective, if I can. So coming back from the, and I'm not sure how many, but there's 800 or so different languages. And within the context of, say, for example, the capital city of Port Moresby, and if Dulciana was here, she'd be able to add more. It is not monolinguistic. So the tones, if someone speaks in English uh, about someone else and tries to culturally or negatively appropriate, you know, the, the, act, the tone of voice or whatever against them, I have not noticed that much happening because people speak about 12 different languages each individually. So it's a sort of a different linguistic context. And then they hear probably another 12 languages. Mm. So, because we've come out of a, and this is just my guessing, I'm not an anthropologist, but out of an atomized society. So whilst English is the main vernacular and there's different accents according to where people have come from, I personally have not noticed people uh, commenting. It may be an Australian English cultural phenomena i don't know but i don't notice the the mimicking or the or the the uh the the fun poking fun type of thing uh because everyone speaks different languages everyone hears everything and it's sort of not not necessarily a big deal because there's english there's australian english there's what we call oxford english because lots of people speak the queen's english so-called there's pigeon english uh there's more to or, and then there's place talk. So, for example, mm. I can I can speak about six and I can hear about six, mm. but it's too hard to mimic someone else. I wouldn't be able to do the great complex. Is is what I think happened. I think um, I think I think when everybody's father was saved by your mob on the Kokoda Trail, yeah, they yeah, decided to lay off you for a century or so. But it's coming. It's well, coming. My You're going to get one it. Of those on the 39th Battalion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a beautiful poem um, called Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels uh, <laughs> dedicated to that, um, which is a bit weird. It's not exactly uh, Welsh in its in its in its lyricism. In fact, it's pretty it's a pretty clunky old I've bit, of, uh, yeah, <laughs> bit of fun. That we, one we have some ritual conflict with the Pacific Islands coming this Saturday. I gather you're bringing a few New Zealanders as well in the All Blacks team, but it's mainly Pacific Islanders, all right? So that, that's on this Saturday in Cardiff. But mm. I think, you know, there's a saying in Wales, Welsh, English is too good for the English. And, and we, we generally think most things are too good for the English. But if you actually look at it, English is the new Latin. Um, and it's a very, I mean, it is a hugely rich language. It's got more words in it than any other language, I think by a factor of three is it creates a simulating words from other languages. Shakespeare brought 750 words from Welsh into the English language because yeah. he liked the sound of them. And the amount of Hindi words is huge. So I think we have to treat the English language separately from the English. It's, it's a lingua franca. Yeah, yeah but that's, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a growth thing. I, mean, I, I don't believe it's a language that increases in complexity. I don't think it's structurally capable of that, you know, as basically a trade creole, um, what it is. I, I mean, it, it's infinitely expanding, you know, much like the purpose of what it was created for. Um, but there's not a lot of complexity developing within it, um, except for when I use it, because, you know, I, I, I'm taking it for some tight I, I, spins I around it, tight bends. No. There's a lot of Welsh and Irish and Indian poets and authors who disagree with me <clears> on that person. Yeah, it's true. Where, where, it's, where it gets interesting is in its um, creolized forms around the world, um, where people are, you know, are picking it up and, and sort of hybridizing it with other things. Look, I tell you, it frustrates me always talking to complexity, complexity scientists. Um, it's like you're all terrified of the P word. You, no, nobody, nobody's mentioned power yet. So we're, we're talking about uh, identity and... Um, 
Yeah, and the reasons for why why offence may be uh, uh, given or received. And uh, no one mentioned power yet. Yeah, I think it links with cultural appropriation. It's, it's actually quite interesting. <clears throat> the Welsh national costume was created by English for their tourist industry yeah. in the 19th century. Yeah, so they, they took artifacts of working people's lives and then effectively created their own cultural artifact from it. I mean, the kilt was invented to keep a Hanoverian king happy. Braveheart is a complete nonsense. There were no kilts until the 19th century, and then they created, and ironic if you don't know it, a Welshman created a book of tan tartans because he could make money out of selling it, and that's taken off ever since. So <laughs> I, I think th this issue about, you know, it, it's a sort of cultural appropriation. There's also a degree of compliance in it. It's like, well, if this is the way we deal with the bastards by playing yeah, you know, by playing up. And I remember Auntie Beryl, all right, we both know. And she Auntie Beryl Carmichael. Um, yeah, Nyempa Elder. But we talked with ABC and she put on this Aboriginal power. And I say, why do you do that? And she said, she they take me more seriously. So that, that ability to use language to almost yeah. reverse power can be quite important. Yeah, mm -hmm. in terms of and, and of course, I think, hey. I, I think there's an extent to which we've benefited from it. Um, in this really kind of mixed up way um, that, you know, we've almost become our oppressor in a sense, um, in, in that Wales, you know, as an indigenous kind of ground dwelling race of people, um, you know, as Dave mentioned, kind of assimilates to the English and, and sides with them, and then have gone on to, to continue that oppression onto other groups of people. Um, so, so there's a, a point, I think, by which is a, an identity, Welsh people in that sense, probably feel a little bit conflicted. Um, so the, the power dynamic that's going on there isn't one directional. Yeah, that's true. I, speaking of direction, I, I just have to jump in there for Arnie Beryl. Um, with, I, I, th I think that river's flowing back the other way, Dave, um, because she used to camp with me at my house all the time. Yeah. So I've heard her talking in her sleep. And how you talk in your sleep, that's your proper accent. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and the patois, that's how she talks. <laughs> for, for sure. But she can, she can, uh, code switch, uh, code switch with the best of us. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, where we start to come into economics is, is when we look at, uh, when we start to look at cultural appropriation. Um, and I think there's something of an economic, uh, imperative to that. It's not just a Halloween costume or a novelty. Um, you know, I think it's it's basically the 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 cultural front line of um, of extraction and and the economies and the systems that drive extraction. Um, yeah, Merv, any ideas there? Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, to yours and I think Dave's and Beth's Beth's commentary earlier about power. Yeah. Uh, just before we get on to uh, economics. Oh no, that'll go right through. Power is going right through the economics there too. <laughs> Well, uh, so just in terms of power, and I, I'm, my context is Papua and Papua New Guinea. Again, my colleague Dulciana would have been able to add more. Hopefully, she can at another time. But in terms of power, we have cultural, uh, shall we say, artifacts. We have we have chieftains, and they they wear certain things. And then we have uh, women who are also in matriarchal areas, also uh, women chief chieftains as well, and they hold power by wearing certain things uh, and, and, and also by carrying a certain spear or a shield. And Dulciana's uh, famous dad was, was, was Chief Michael Samari, Sir Michael Samari, and held a lot of power. And that linked it to, into the building the economic structures of the nation. Uh, he wasn't just prime minister, uh, but he was also a chief from his village. So he brought that power and that influence. So I just wanted to mention that. But also mm. in the way I was growing up in terms of power, I was part of a caste in between a lot of us, you know, the mixed races, so-called, or the visible, the visible mixtures in society. And uh, uh, in terms of law, behaviors, work, leisure, uh, certain people had more power and more freedom than others within a constrained set of boundaries or 
they didn't call it as call it apartheid, but it was an apartheid administration. So that was again an exercise of power and the influence on one's freedom and identity. Hmm. I just leave it there for now. I'm not sure yeah. if I'm there. Well, look, and, and until Queensland, Queensland was forced uh, to give Papua back, um, you know, and that, that line was drawn through the sea, you know, um, I think there was a bigger uh, power overlay there and, and a very big uh, uh, system of extraction there. So both of those cultural items, which you can still see in any secondhand shop in any uh, city in Australia, uh, which you can still see in any uh, street markets or anything like that. I could probably buy a chieftain's mask or something if I felt yes. like it. You know, they're, they're, you've got that extraction there. Uh, it's hard to go to a settler's house anywhere from central Queensland uh, uh, um, or even south mask. of there without seeing, um, you know, Papuan spears on the wall or something like that yeah. or, 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 or something there's, there's a link there to being the used as sort economic. of you know salad mixes or something like this um but then there's also the copper which is which is a, and there's a the, the cape york facility which was a satellite dish built at the top of australia and that was specifically to spy on your mobs um to intercept um you know terrorist activities coming from your people who might have been trying to um you know yeah, there's, reclaim there's their homelands here. Um, that was our interaction. Indeed, I the think thank you between power appropriation and economics. Though. So, one of the things you see at the moment, and I mean, I remember the first time I saw it was in um, actually in Broken Hill, where we had somebody who was six foot two inches tall, blonde and fair haired and blue eyed, using a, a Native American talking stick and claiming she was a shark woman. And it was kind of like it, it's appropriation of wisdom, and we see the same thing with oh. artifacts. But also, with it, it's like the sort of Peloponnesian navigation and other things like this. These are things which have come out of generations of work, and they're used to ascribe power to somebody who hasn't been through the same process, and that has economic advantage. Mm. And I think it, it's almost like you know, if, if I can say I got my talking stick from Chief, whatever it is, when I spent eight days in the spiritual you know, retreat in the Navajo desert. I have power over the pe other people. So it, it's the appropriation of culture for power mm -hmm. for economic things, which I think we're also seeing. It's easy to see mm -hmm. an artifact. So that's easy yeah, to yeah. see an idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd just like to raise another thing, and I don't know if it's, if it's art or power or both, or economics, but I'll just show you something here. I spend my days, you like COVID days, uh, Tyson, as you said, my COVID days, when I get bored, uh, can you see this? Mm. I I put what's in my head from my, my Papuan background, I, and I've got lots of them, and I, it, it's not tangible, but it's invisible, and then it becomes visible, and that's the sort of stuff that I used to have in my growing up. Mm. So they're all around here. And people wonder what's wrong with me, but it's come out of my head. And I have, I feel powerful, Dave, in expressing it. And Beth. So I don't know, I'll throw that in the ring. Yeah. <laughs> I do those too. They're like, they're like post-it notes. <laughs> you know, because you, you're having thoughts and, ideas, and you, you keep that knowledge in those things. Yes. How can we actually share the, the, the positive um, or exporting in ways that are culturally respectful because I, i'm pretty sure that the people outside of our cultures look in and think oh I, i'd love to have a bit of that it seems to resonate with me somewhere and i can i can recognize that in myself during my time living in australia um that, that seeing the way aboriginal people did certain things actually awoke part of me um as a welsh person who's probably had quite similar experiences um mm. so how can we actually give some of the gifts of these things and share them with the world and, and you know there's great power to be had and, and plenty of people to benefit from yeah. it good question without, without it losing um respect for that culture and without it becoming appropriative mm. is, is yeah. there any kind of way in which you can see that happening I think it's when you go on the same journey. I think if you, if you learn and go on a journey, that's respect. If you just take and use, that's appropriation. Yeah, it's, I, I think that's the issue. So, you know, cultures, 
advanced by people spending time with other cultures, being in with them. Yeah, it takes. I mean, you know, classic case on this is a London taxi driver. It takes two to three years for their brain to physically change for them to have the knowledge. And you can argue, you know, most cultural knowledge is embodied. It's not just embodied and enacted. It's not just cognitive. So I think it's a willingness to go through that process to be part of the journey, which makes it learning, not appropriation. Mm. Well, th there is a process that turns an object into a commodity. Mm. You know, in order to take something and turn it into a product, there is a, a cultural process, which is also an economic process there. And it involves removing that thing from its context. It involves um, sanitizing it repackaging it, branding it, and, um, and giving it a different purpose, value adding in that way. So you're somehow taking, I mean, that whole idea of how you create value anyway, is that you take nature, and then you, you, you increase its value by applying labor to it. And then, you know, butter boom, you got a commodity, you have something that has value, something that's limitable and excludable, and therefore can have a price. Uh, did I miss any bits? Yeah, well, now, I, I think one of the worst to... examples I've seen, which is relevant, is the, appro is the anthropological appropriation of other people's stories. So it's where the ethnographer gathers people's stories, codifies them, puts them in a library, and makes them a historical artifact. So they stop mm. becoming a living source of meaning within the community. Mm. It's all yeah. fossilized yeah. in that culture. Yeah? Yeah. And I think yeah. that, that's also very, very common. Yeah. I'll give you a personal example, another one that's linked linked to all my shields. I live at the moment, or I'm locked down in a in a hotel, uh, a hotel in Canberra. I've made about 20 of these shields. I also make prow boards in in between my work. And because and this this may trigger something because the people here largely are Pacifica. Uh, they they manage this place, this hotel. A couple of them saw this. Uh, mm -hmm. Guess what? A lot of these are now <laughs> displayed in the foyer. Some people <laughs> want to buy them. I've said I don't want any money. The the proceeds are going to the homeless mm -hmm. outside this posh hotel. Mm -hmm. So that's just a little story for you to unpack. Yeah, it's it's interesting that just the the, the everyday <laughs> cultural objects that can get value added in that way and become a commodity. I tell you, if I walk into one more lobby, um, you know, of a, of a fancy motel or a, or a really big lawyer's building or something like that, if I walk into one more lobby where I see a whole heap of Aboriginal log coffins sort of arranged in a, um, you know, a lovely installation, <laughs> <laughs> it's like it, I always find it really disturbing, yes. and it's like the the people there have gone. Oh, they want the coffins. All right, we'll make them a bunch of coffins. Yeah, Aren't yeah. they beautiful? Uh, I don't know. Makes my belly hurt. Yeah. So Beth, that might be your answer to your question, or one of your answers. Yeah. 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 Yep. Beth, you're, you've been attenuated. Your language kind of is the the room I want to make. Right? So I'm sure Dave an idea of commodity. Am I, am I back now? You're back. Am you're back. back. So you need to start again. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the issue of mining and coal. Um, oh God. Yeah. Kind of one that touches all of us. I'm pretty sure. Um, and, and, and particularly the Welsh, how we've been encouraged and thought it's a really wonderful thing to, to kind of rape and pillage our own land and natural resource. Mm. Um, and when you actually look back at a lot of the propaganda and the, 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 the English narrative around that, it's how wonderful it was for us to be empowered to have this incredible, you know, the, we'll be the, the gods of the underworld if you, you know, go mm. and pick up the coal. Um, and, and and to actually yeah to, to totally lose the connection with what was above the, the surface of the, the land um, and the, the, the loss of the tragedy people... which goes with it i mean and anybody in my generation knows exactly where they were when they hear the news of Aberfan. 
which is when one of the soil tips from the mines, which everybody knew was going to collapse sometime and there was too much corruption, yeah, basically took out a whole school with its children. I can still remember exactly where I was mm. in our house in Cardiff looking at the television. Yeah. I think it's part of the landscape of South Wales is now is the soil pits. Yeah, the, 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 the debris of that industrial period. Yeah, and I think one of the big questions for the valleys, for example, and the same is true in North Wales, because where I grew up, it was slate, not coal. Yeah, and the slate mines were there. But the soil, the soil tips from mining activities are now part of the landscape. They're an integral part of the landscape. It can't be separated from them. And we, we've got to find ways, I think, to accommodate that. I'm not sure what the hell we do with open cast mining in Australia. That's a whole different thing. Mm. Reflecting on Aberfan, there obviously uh, 55 years this week, um, 144 children. This is the school that was crushed. It was an entire generation that doesn't exist in that village. Um, and and these are people, you know, Dave was there. This is living history. This isn't kind of way back when. And and this is the, the part of Wales where I, I was living and, and where I'm from. Um, and it's still an issue. There are still coal tips that are unstable and threatening people's houses and, and, and lives underneath. And yet somehow it's okay to spend, is it 11 billion on, on refurbishing the Houses of Parliament? Mm. I mean, it's interesting though, because when we looked at yes, the Grendel disaster, which is when that tower block in London, the cladding just went up in flames and similar numbers died, right? I remember talking with people that doing a narrative project on that, and it turned out somebody had already been in. They'd taken the stories from the survivors, and then they'd appropriated the stories to justify the politics of the way the thing had been built. So people's own material had been used against them. Yeah, And mm. I think that that's the other issue you see. And it, it is an identity issue because it it makes indigenous groups into permanent victims or people. This is this point I made earlier. You're put in a category where the imperial power needs to look after you because you're not quite good enough, but mm -hmm. they respect. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's the sort of thing you see coming through. And that's what creates really bitter resentment, right? Um, mm -hmm. In the way that people are designated. I mean, the Irish have had this from the English for as long as we've had it, yeah? In yeah. some ways worse. Mm. Well, but having said that, in Dublin, they tell Irish jokes about Kerry Map, and so it sort of goes across areas. So just within the context, uh, agreed, Dave, uh, uh, within the context of Papua New Guinea, and we all know what happened with Bougainville and Bougainville Copper, and there was a big war. Mm. A war began as a result. But I was there in the early days when we taught social science to high school kids, and in the curriculum, and I'm talking out of school, but this is the truth. Uh, in the curriculum, it was about how great Bougainville copper was going to be for the for the nation. You mm. know? And there were those of us who were social science, critical, reflective teachers who who changed that curriculum. It was a demonstration school, I'll say at Gordon High School in Port Moresby. So it was where diplomats and everyone from around the world came. So there was power there. But we changed it so that our year uh, nine year 10 kids were able to critically reflect in circles rather than being told that the the copper was going to be okay for the water the pit, the fish were not going to be poisoned the, the forests were going to be fine etc etc and they were quite critically reflective very smart kids this is way back and uh so you know we know the history there eventually there was a war and they're still in a sense uh, politically uh, uh, hurt by it. Mm. That was an external organization coming in, mining the copper and the gold and whatever else, and telling everyone it's going to be all right. So just jumping off Dave's commentary there. Uh, it's really amazing innovators, though, because they made those like crossbows that weren't crossbows. You know, they got the rubber off the, off the mining equipment yeah. and, and, and just sort of made like these little guns that would shoot deadly arrows so hard that they'd go through a car door. Just absolutely, like, yeah. amazing innovation. Um, yeah, so the, the tech is pretty good uh, yeah. in Bougainville. Uh, uh, yeah. we, we've all got mining in our histories, right? And that is a common Indigenous issue, right? 
So, yeah, you, your land becomes valuable because it contains something that somebody wants to rip out of it. And, and mining is almost by definition, yeah, the concept of a non-renewable. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's extractive, it doesn't renew, it leaves waste, it leaves poison, it leaves everything else. Now, we're not saying we don't have to do mining, but it is it becomes part of the identity of the people because you have to accept the pollution and everything else which goes with it because that's what makes your land valuable. Yeah, and yeah, you know, I think that there's something in that. And I think it's also in this wider issue of how do we, you know, it's this issue about ownership, right? So when people, I mean, there wasn't, a, you know, land in Wales was fairly similar. It was owned by families. It wasn't owned by individuals. Mm. And we didn't have primogenitor. So basically, I mean, that made us weak against the English because one person never inherited it. It was always divided as it mm. went. Yeah. So, but the concept of land was closer, I think, to where you're coming from on this, Tyson. But then it becomes the concept of mineral rights is an exploitative concept in its own right. So you can have the surface, but we own what lies underneath it. Yeah. And I think that the economics of that are fascinating because the communities from whom which the material is exploited have actually never benefited economically from it. Yeah, we went from a rural culture to an impoverished urban culture. Mm. Yes, indeed, indeed. Well, look, um, yeah, local local grotto mining is sustainable. You can have local mining for, yeah. you know, thousands of years. Um, we've had that here, like particularly with, you know, ochre mines, uh, greenstone quarries, you know, everything you want to anything you can imagine um except for uranium and and such well we're doing we've been you know local grotto mining uh for the purposes of the community is um that's some sustainable stuff big thing in wales and it is a part of an identity is the english take water from us yeah the whole valleys have been drowned by acts of parliament from westminster against the opposition of the local inhabitants yeah to create water liverpool and birmingham and I think that that's the next level. You can see that we're, we're talking with First Nation people in Canada on the next one. Yeah, the water's a huge issue in Australia. Just in Canada, is going to be massive. Right? Mm. Well, and Queensland again, Queensland legislation is interesting around water. It's I'm trying to figure it out. It seems that that water is like in the Commons um, while it's in the air. If it's airborne, it's anybody's. Uh, but the moment it touches the surface, it belongs to the government. Um, it's a weird one. Mary Dali Basin is its own story in its own right. Oh my goodness! Let's not even uh, let's not even go there, because water uh, was running in Broken Hill when I was there. Yeah. So from water also to trees. I mean, in Papua New Guinea, for example, lots of trees have been cut down, lots of forests, and I'm sure the same in Queensland there, Tyson. Yeah. 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 yeah that's it. Well, so so where is the value here? You know. Is it just that, um, I don't know, the systems of accounting that that exist for this, you know, global economic system at the moment, um, is it just that they can only measure things that are nouns? You know, they can't, uh, they can't measure actions and relations. Is it just that they can only yeah. measure things? Is, is this the problem? Um, I wouldn't mind having a bit of a deep dive in on the economic side now as well I'd, I'd be interested to know about uh, pre-medieval uh, welsh economies also i mean that, that's fascinating sorry dave go discussing. on beth you go first um dave discussing the idea of, of wales becoming uh an ur of, of lots of south wales becoming an urban economy i i can't even agree with that i think it's become a dependence economy mm. yeah. um by that. That, that, that so much dependence was built upon the promise and the hope that the mines brought that the people were told that this is you know this is your opportunity you're you're fueling the world um there was so much lordship and heroism kind of given to, to the miners and the local communities uh. um and when that is pulled from under your feet very very quickly and and to recognize the amount of sacrifice that went into that the loss of whole communities um you know working age men regular mine collapses um, they've invested a lot into that identity and it's become people. And once that's pulled away, 
then people become dependent upon funding from what was at that point then the English state. Mm. Um, so that, well, there's so much dependence now, dependent on that. Life expectancy was in the mid mid thirties, in the mines. Yeah, mm. if, you, if you actually looked at it, and I mean, one of the terrifying things if you ever go to Wales, there's one deep mine left open as a tourist attraction. So I went down with my kids, and I'm claustrophobic, so it took a lot for me to do it. But they actually put the kids by a door, and then they switch all the lights off. And they say, at your age, this would have been your first day of work for a twelve-hour shift. Mm. standing by this door in the pitch dark with only noises and moving the doors and that's within living memory yeah that, I think it's interesting when i was taught management economics minds are valued in terms of what comes out of them there's no valuation of what's left i think this comes back to your point tyson mm. is it, it's the thing which is valued so once the thing is taken from the land the land has no value by implication and therefore it can become a soil tip and everything else. Which and way? I think our asset valuation is one of the big issues here because we don't value the asset as a whole. We value the thing we take out of the asset. Mm. Yeah. So, so I'll just add something there. I agree with you guys. Um, first of all, I don't speak for any government of Papua New Guinea. I speak for myself as an observer, but this power link in there, especially when we involve governments and, and a lot of governments, national governments, including this one here and a lot around the world are involved with that mining that, that, uh, you know, s somehow wanting to get what the value is in the trees or the, the metal or the, the water or whatever, but still they leave a path of devastation behind them, whether it's uh, unintentional or otherwise, but there's always the notion of corruption that underpins a lot of that, in my view, uh, throughout all nations, not not any one in particular, and it's about that power and influence. And again, it's about money, uh, whether it be brown paper bags or otherwise. There's an interesting question in the chat. Some Lizzie has asked about donut economics, mm. uh, which is Kate's, right? Now, I have this hugely ambiguous concern about donut economics because it actually adopts the assumptions of neoclassical economics to get people to accept it. Yeah. But it's to change the structure. But it doesn't really shift into complexity-based economics. And the big question for me, and it's on all of these sort of things, is, is this a way of effectively candy coating something which then won't change? Or is mm -hmm. it a stepping down to change? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big issue, all right? Because we, we say in complexity, you start journeys with a sense of direction. So you, know, you have to find the next right thing to do and then look again and then the next right thing. So it's all a, a journey between stepping stones. The trouble is, if the stepping stone becomes too deep in a tractor, you may never escape it. It may be used to justify what came before. And I think, to my mind, the jury is out on donut economics that it was hugely progressive yeah um mm. but does it allow for example somebody to say that they're doing something because they can create neoclassical measures while not actually really changing or gaming the system and i, I don't know i don't don't dispute the intentions of yeah. it yeah i think carla's working somewhere <clears throat> to L yeah I, it's possibly more interesting i kind of see it as part of that sort of raft of ideas that's around our capitalism 2.0 you know the stakeholder stakeholder capitalism like i i, I kind of i don't know yeah, there, there's that there's that possibility of it just becoming a rebranding, a rebranding of capital rather than, uh, you know, anything else. It's funny, we only mentioned donut economics once when we were preparing for this. It's when we were talking about uh, the island of Nauru, which is kind of in the shape of a donut now after the mining happened. <laughs> I wonder if under donut economics, it, it, that would or would not be a donut. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Beth, where are you going to take us now? Oh, I, I think that there's definitely something to be further explored around attitudes towards money and economy, cultural attitudes. Mm. I think that, that from a Welsh perspective, we, we we don't like to see wealthy people, even of our own. Mm. Um, yeah. 
that, that we, we've got a very strong sense of self-regulating. If I'm poor, we're all going to be poor in this together. Mm. Um, we, we love a bit of collective struggle. Um, and, and again, a lot of that will come from the, the mining and our heavily unionized yeah, the history. Um, yeah. history. Uh, and I was curious, is, is that an indigenous thing all in all because we don't value money or we value <coughs> the money? Well, Oh yes, yeah. it's it's it, well well we uh, my mob says uh wukung at um and sort of translate that as um you know money nothing for us money bad yeah, for us a huge yeah. in South Wales which is quite important so the women used to line up at the mine on a Friday and the men would hand over their wage packets and their wives would give them beer money back right and then yep. the wives would. Look the needs of that community and i think there was that strong matriarchal tradition there yeah mm. in terms of independency and it was shameful not to do that mm. and i think the role of shame is something but when you move into highly atomistic individual societies shame goes away because actually what you can get away with is legitimate whereas in a collective community exploitation is shameful therefore you're less likely to do it or if so the community will exclude you mm. and that's the thing we started to talk about last time which is the idea about a gift and when i was working in kakadu a gift wasn't an exchange it was a membership fee mm. yeah, and it was uh, what you got yeah yeah and i i think really be that there's a ritual about a gift which means the community accepts you and the community can exclude you it's not a universal all right if it's kind of like if you're not part of that and i think we've lost that concept and i think this is one of the things beth was talking about <coughs> and it, it's what actually in denmark sorry being as best in denmark they call tall it's called the law of yante which means tall poppy syndrome so if you try and stand above the crowd somebody will come, come along with a scythe and it's actually quite interesting if you go into wales the aristocracy are english there isn't really a middle class there's a sort of upper working class and a lower mm. middle class mm. But there isn't that middle class, right? In that sense. Yeah. Well, our our, our species is not not fond of um, hierarchies. Uh, arguably, I I know that there's been a few studies on that, and um, at the, that will argue both sides. Yeah. It's role based authority, so it, it's kind of like you might be leading the hunt, but that doesn't mean you're in charge of the tribe, right? Mm. In, in that sense, but it's mm. that ability to. I think this is what crews do in the military environment, by the way, which take off from that, is yeah. they distribute authority in context. Dynamic, right? so dynamic subordination. It's quite authority, sophisticated, actually. Yeah. Not a hierarchical-based authority. Yeah. yeah. Even though they say it's hierarchical, it's quite, it's much more polyarchical. Well, it's hierarchical until they get off the boat. While, <laughs> they're, do you think while they're on the boat, hierarchy. hierarchy. Then they get off the boat, they land in the shit. It's distributed. Yeah. yeah. I've, so seen, me... I've seen a sergeant tear a two star general apart in public for interfering with the weapon system. And, and the two star general took it on the chin and walked off and apologized. And uh, you mm, wouldn't see me. that in India. See, that's why he didn't have three stars, though, Dave. <laughs> but, but, but in a sense, but seriously, in a sense, that's, that's the next, that's for me, that's the next trend of leaders or the quality of leadership. Uh, if that can be done, you know, if, if they say, no, you can't go, or oh, it didn't happen to my dad on the Kokoda track. He spoke out, he was Sergeant Major. He spoke out to a general uh, against a brigadier. And so he never got his officer's stripes as a result. But he did save, you know, a couple of dozen people, Australian soldiers by the general listening to him. But he, he again... I did a project on small group band in Washington. And at one point, a four-star general said, would you mind taking my sergeant out into the corridor so he can tell you what I need to know so you can come and tell yeah, me as yeah. a consultant. Yeah, uh, and I, it was quite interesting. What I found is that if you talk to American three, four-star generals, they take criticism. British ones generally won't. Yeah. And I, I think it down with this active warfare issue because the americans are constantly bloody fighting people like the english did before they've got that sort of winnowing effect in it but i think i want to come back to the identity issue because i think that's fundamental one of the big distinctions in political science and philosophy is between social atomism and communitarianism. 
So is your primary identity, you as an individual, is your primary identity the tribe of which you're a part? And it's a fundamental divide. It's Catholic and Protestants and all sorts of things, right? And if your identity is in the network of relationships which you have, then although it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you're non-exploitative, but exploitation is far less likely than if you see the community as something which is there, which is a bargain you make, right? It's this concept mm. of a social contract, which I think is fundamentally flawed. Is it's my choice whether I'm part of this community and the community owes me something. That's very different. From the sort of yeah. linkage communitarian type concept. Mm. Well, I think that's what the project of, I mean, what they call neoliberalism, you know, um, most of that's been about over the last 30 or 40 years, social fragmentation. And I think it's, it's, and that's just to facilitate extraction. It's very, very difficult to extract from an extended family, from a community, from a clan. Uh, it is very, it's very hard to do that, but it's very easy to extract from an individual or a sort of a loose cluster of individuals who sort of share a, a, just a group identity that's a name, like this is the name of our tribe and I am one of them, that's me, I'm in the, that tribe. But um, really it's just an individualized identity. Uh, I find that with most of the group identity brandings that we have now, they're not really group identities in that there's a fluid self other boundary between yourself and the group. You know, uh, you don't really belong to the group. That's just part of your demographic profile, you mm. know. And mm. I find that that kind of social fragmentation, um, I know you mentioned clubs earlier, Dave, you know, and, and you, you see all those clubs breaking up. They don't have a lot of clubs anymore. Uh, just that data set's an interesting thing to look at. But, yeah, that's uh, I think that's made people vulnerable as individuals to extraction. I think it's mm. also can so on a Saturday, I'm going to be wearing a red Welsh shirt and I'm going to be in the Millennium Stadium. I refuse to call it the Principality Stadium, right? We're not a bloody Principality, right? Um, where, and I, I hope that, that we might be... Oh, sorry, they, they, they've renamed our National Rugby Stadium the Principality Stadium. And if you want to upset the Welsh, call us a Principality, because we're not, we're a country. Mm. All right, that's actually really important. So, the, you know, the, this decision... I'll be wearing a red shirt in the hope we might beat the All Blacks in my lifetime because the last time was the year before I was born. Yeah? Mm. The previous weekend, I was wearing my blue and black shirt while we stuffed bloody Newport. All right, so at that point, we've got this conflict, but we're, it's two tribes, yeah, and then, but we're then we're one tribe in a different context. And I think it's that ability to shift between identities based on context. And it's like the clan to the tribe to the horde. It's that sort of ability to manage those fluid identity structures. And if you just yeah, focus cool. on the everything is me, 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 and you're quite right, that was the neoliberal mythology. Mm. That if we focus everything on the individual, magically it will sort it out, which actually means people didn't read Adam Smith. Everybody mm. reads Adam Smith to justify neoliberal economics. Nobody reads his bloody books on ethics, mm. which were actually more important. Mm. So we do change identity, don't we? Like we whether we're at the footy or, or or wherever like i feel very strong and i take your point tyson i feel very strongly uh, from millen bay the, the modewa tribal identity but you're right uh, it is a demographic type of identity even though in in me and in my kids and my family we're very strongly modewa and we, mm. we we tie in with the one talk the one talk system this is with your economics uh beth your question originally there economic relations, we tie in with one talks, meaning when I see someone and you guys do as well, Tyson, your mob, uh, when you see someone, you're, they're your brother, your brother, cousin, sister, aunt. Um, so there's that one talk system. There is a sort of a hierarchy in my society. The women are the final arbiters, the decision makers. There's not many in Papua. Mostly it's a patriarchal society. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. It's called the Welsh man where I come from. That's where the authority lies. Okay, there you go. So there's the women. Look, I can remember an auntie Florentina who wasn't really related, but she was the boss of us all, you know? And and she wasn't blood related, but she was part of the tribe. Mm. And, 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 and the women would let the men, and my dad and others, my dad was white Australian, but he was accepted in the, in the fraternity. And they'd talk about it all about the activities or the roadmap, as we'd call it. But the women would have the final strategic decision. They have to go back to the women. And so there was power there. Uh, 
the economics, I suppose, was the cultivation of the garden or whatever, or the building of the canoes or the killing of the pigs for the feast or what, whatever it was. Mm. Uh, but in the power, the power line ran through the aunties and the, and the, the mums. Yeah. So mm. I don't know how, where that stands, but we valued shells. We bartered a lot. The land was valued, the relationships, the tribal feasts, the canoes, the pigs, family was valued. I didn't see any dollars until the European, as we say, the Europeans came, and then the money or the, the whatever you call it, became more important. Mm. But they had these shells, and if you see Trobury and they Ireland, were tokens. Yeah, but they were very valuable. They made mm. people feel they were the rich. Women. They were stores stores of value. Yeah. yeah. And was it because of scarcity of those shells? Yeah, they were, it was scarce. But uh, for example. From Dulciana's area of Port Moresby, they would come down and they'd barter a uh, betel nut, and then we'd give them potatoes, uh, yams, and taros, and they'd be a two-way thing, and then they'd make it up with shells as well, mm. or pig, or pigs. Mm. And that was not very long ago. That was 40, 50 years ago. Mm. And now it's all money, of course. Mm. Well, we um, the word I used, the language word I used before for money. Um, that's a loan word. We actually borrowed that from your mom. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's where we got that. And also, um, you know, I, I make dugout canoe as well. And, um, yeah. and a lot of your dugout canoe shape, uh, and techniques, um, that's influenced our dugout canoes as yeah, well. Yeah. So there's that kind of cultural exchange happening there. What's the difference between that and appropriation? in um mm. in our economic systems what is it about our economic systems traditionally that prevents things from being um theft exactly. and actually makes it some kind of exchange what is it yeah there, there are really interesting social practices i remember when i first took my wife home to cardiff right and she's french huguenot exile london so she doesn't come from the same culture and for some reason her relatives resent the fact she married a Catholic. For some reason, burning most of them alive is considered something we shouldn't have done, right? But we took her home and the family had a problem with a divorce, right? So the women all assembled in the kitchen to cook a meal and dumped the men in front of the television to actually do the rugby. And we weren't allowed to go into the kitchen, even though I did the cooking. And the assumption was all the women would cook a full meal while actually deciding whether somebody in the family could be divorced or not. Uh. And that, that, thing, that, that council actually had to do. And I said, remember, that's the way I grew up. It's like if the women are in the kitchen, you sit, you sit down and you shut up and you will be fed and watered. All right. I mean, yeah, the beer will flow and the food will arrive. And if you haven't eaten, the, you know, the Welsh cakes that your grand made, you are in real trouble because you'll be held up for the next 10 years for failing to do that. But this what you've got is these social contexts which allow decisions to be made. And I think we've over formalized decision making in distributed communities. I, we, and I think this is part of the problem with the sort of one person, one vote concept of democracy, which is a very Anglo-Saxon concept, mm. if you actually look at it, um, in terms of the way it works. And I think one of the big things is to come back to the power word, is actually looking at how power gets distributed, both formally and informally. It's like the work we're doing to build informal networks. Very true. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Informal networks are just healthy. And we don't have the informal power structures anymore because we've lost the social cohesion. Hey, Beth, what do you think about that? Particularly, and, and I want you to think about the um, the Dow nerds, the distributed autonomous organization, uh, you know, um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you know, all the crypto nerds and everything else and um, and all that side of things. What what are they missing? What are they missing from this uh, this big sort of tech solution drive towards um, you know decentralization? Uh, what are they missing in their their leadership and economic models and everything else that they could learn from um, Indigenous Wales and Papua and Australia? I have to confess to having a foot in both camps here. Go on um, then. So... <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for, for, for sharing the good. Um... But there has to be something to it more than just a technological distribution. Um, because if people, you know, we've seen it kind of the everybody simping after Elon Musk, whatever Elon Musk does, everybody else 
copies, follows. Um, and, and it, it yeah, if, if you give people absolute freedom and there's already an inherent power differential there, the gradient in that system is always going to be geared towards that already existing established power. Um, so actually, how can you almost either work around that power um, mm. in a, a more autonomous way? Because they say it's not autonomous if it's automatically geared towards <clears throat> that power. Um, well, we we've have actually had a comment, a uh, question about that and a request in the chat there. Um, uh, somebody referencing Adi Mary Graham uh, is a, a Combo Mary elder and academic uh, knowledge keeper uh, here from Australia that um, I've, I've done a fair bit of work with. Now she talks about the difference between power and authority. That the power power is always distributed, you know, within the community, but authority is held, you know, oh. uh, by different quite exclusive groups. Uh, yeah, with restricted yeah. knowledge and that there is a difference between power and authority so I'd, I'd be interested to see if uh, what all your different cultural takes are on the difference between those two things I'd want to start and, and not not go straight into the issue of power and authority um, but actually to look at um, ability to articulate mm. um, and collective understanding and collective collective imagination mm. um, and I think that this comes into the, the Wales thing in particular and as I've mentioned last time the loss of the Welsh language and the prevalence of it it's very very difficult to share a common history if I've lost my ability to speak in that language mm. um, so it, it, it breaks down the, the potential for collectivism amongst Welsh people um, I'm unable to articulate half of my feelings until I hear somebody who's a native Welsh speaker say something and it feels like the missing piece of the jigsaw. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of people say when they hear Kinevin, it's like, oh, you know, I've felt this all my life and I've never had the word to express it. Um, mm -hmm. And actually how across a network comes in senses of coherence and common, like the, the Venn diagram whereby we can all actually unite around something. Mm. And, and for us, particularly linguistically, that has been decimated. Mm. Um, so, so we've become very, very fragmented in that sense. And so when you say that individual people have power, yes, they might, but it, 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 it's not the same as having a collective power, mm. um, which is something that's been trampled on quite a bit in, in a while. Yeah. Concept. Well, then there's a difference with authority once again. Hey, maybe English <laughs> is just this standardized protocol that's... Um, there and allowing us to have this yarn in the first place. Uh, yeah, but you have to remember the English, I mean, all of the English public schools were brought up on Roman history. Mm. Roman history fundamentally informs English and that fundamentally informed Americans. So if you look at those three empires, they all have mm. the same points and the same bad points. Mm. But I think the key thing, authority is earned over time, power can be taken or, explo or exploited. I think that's the key issue. You, you mm. can't have authority, yeah, unless you've done things and acted and done things over time. Mm. Right? Well, and in, in Latin, power, power, the noun is 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 power, the infinitive, which really just means to be able, yeah. or to be able to. Yeah, um, it's, um, a, it's a it's as well. I, I, I think one of the reasons. I mean, you said up front we haven't mentioned it, Tyson. I think one of the reasons is. You spend too much time with sociologists. They're so obsessed with power. You try and avoid the word as much as possible, even though you know it has application, right? And yeah. we talk more about the assemblage and affordance. So, we, you know, what what does the environment, social and and cultural, give to you, you know, which allows you to do things and doesn't allow you to do other things? What are the structures which inform the way you see it? Mm. And I think critically, word agency is as important. So, what has agency in the system? Right, which mm. can incorporate both power and authority. And mm. that map agency and change in agency, I think, is one of the ways you do things. So one thing we're playing with, for example, is the concept of entangled trios. So you put three people from different backgrounds together, if they make a decision stand. Yeah. So and that's a transparency issue. So you have to have a diversity in transparency, but you don't force it into 
you force that dialogue between difference in order to make a decision. And I think it's like that we need to start to think about as we start to flatten organizations. And yes. as the boundaries between organizations and society break down, because they are going to have to break down over the next few decades. Yeah. Mm. And, and those, those are the, the historical and social movements of management from what I would, uh, what I would call, uh, oligarchy to polyarchy in organization yeah. so-called that sort of thing and somehow the power and authority is mixed in with you know oligarchs and and then uh, distributed to the people at the grassroots and so on and so forth so the power and authority is and people are empowered or enabled or agented or whatever the words are so they become agents of change but at the same time there's authority or sim cultural or symbolic authority with the the queen's the queen's picture in the classroom of a teacher mm -hmm. in Papua mm -hmm. New Guinea. Believe it or not, the queen is still the queen of I mean, Even when I worked for IBM, which was a terribly hierarchical organisation, in fact, it had five intersecting hierarchies, so you never knew who you were working for anyway. But power came if you made a sale to a British client, you had power because nobody would challenge that. Yeah because that was keeping the organization alive. So there are always, organizations always evolve mechanisms and codes that allow the system to be right. broken in some way. Yeah. Sometimes, and I mm. think it's quite fascinating to study that. So economic power. Yeah. Well, it's because it's a commercial organization, it's economic power, yeah? Um, there are other forms of power which can eat, eat, I, I've seen facilitators exploit the power of not, of, of not having an argument. Yeah, they become manipulators rather than not facilitators. Yeah, right. So I, I will intervene. People are having a genuine argument, which is useful. I will now intervene and I will be the person in power because I will stop them having an argument. I'll use this language. And it's that, that, that there's language, and Beth made this point earlier. Language is hugely exploitative in some forms. Yeah, in terms of creating boundaries that people can't cross. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> So one of the one of the ways I use facilitative power, and it could be seen as manipulative, <laughs> hadn't thought of it that way. But at the beginning of some difficult conversations where we have to be challenged, I usually set up uh, what I would ask them to do. I'd say, what would be the detracting behaviors in this meeting? <laughs> and what would be the enhancing behaviors? And we put them all up. So in a sense, I'm, I'm using my power. <laughs> To channel when I was in IBM, we developed facilitation when, when I was in IBM I developed facilitation methods in Denmark so we give the instructions in English but they would speak in Danish so what we basically said the facilitator mustn't get involved in the content because the content is people's content just the process mm. yeah not to influence it and I think that I mean Beth should talk to the points on epistemic justice and cognitive sovereignty because what actually happens is the power to interpret the meeting takes away people's <coughs> takes away people's sovereignty, and that that's some of the wider stuff. Sorry be good to hear that. Be mm. good to hear that, Dave. Uh, so, uh, Beth, yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear about those sovereignties of, with the uh, ways of uh, ways of knowing and ways of thinking uh, going on there. Yeah, and I, I know Dave's probably referenced me on this one quite a few times, but I always kind of start the, the thinking around this is to why is it that old wives' tales are called old wives' tales when old men's tales are called, are called history and philosophy? Um, that, that there is a, an inherent privileging or overprivileging of certain types of information, ways of knowing, and it's usually based upon historical structures. So it can be incredibly difficult to break away from an already entrenched dominant narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and, and especially when that's the, the, the white Western narrative um, is so ubiquitous and so everywhere, all of our historical literature, all of our historical academic literature, which we like to think of as the gold standard, is built upon that positivist white man's um, conception of what what is knowledge, what is valuable, and it's all of the stuff that 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 devalues emotion, human existence, interrelationality, and reduces the system to the things that are in the system mm. as opposed to the relationship between those things. 
Mm. Um, and so actually, I think that a lot of the indigenous culture recognize the flows and the, the in-between space, whereas our dominant narrative, the hegemonic narrative, is all about substance as opposed to the relationship. Yeah. With substance. Yeah. So in Papua, we call that the Nauwa tide, N-A-U-W-A, and it's the water between the canoes. The canoes are carrying the objects of the subject, but it's yeah. the tide and the water in between mm. that also is really critically important. Mm. I think that's what I've interpreted from your comment there, Beth. We, we did a, an Indigenous project in Australia once, and there was a story which illustrates this well, right? So we had a massive fight with the academics, I won't say which university, because they wanted to send in their PhD students to actually get Aboriginals to tell their stories. They would then sit down and codify them and interpret them. And we were going to put in Sense Maker, which meant the Indigenous people could interpret their own stories into a quantitative framework. And they were just totally opposed to this. And we had this ferocious battle going on for about three hours. And eventually I realized he wasn't listening to me. He was basically a professor and I was some bloody consultant. And I obviously, because I had money and that power, I had to be treated with respect. I'd have been thrown out if I was an undergraduate student. And I thought, I've got to get him to think about this. And I said, well, look, tell you what, we'll do both. So we'll gather the narrative and we'll give it to your PhD students. And I'll pay myself for the indigenous people to interpret their own stories. Actually, it wasn't going to cost me anything, but I thought he'd see that. And then, then, then we could, then we're both happy. And you could see he suddenly started to think. And then he said, "But then you'll compare the way we interpret it with the way they interpret it." And I said, "Well, yeah, we might do that." He, and then he said, "And then you'll write a paper on how culturally biased we are." And I said, "Well, that's quite probable." And it was interesting <laughs> and until he was faced with that. He just hadn't seen what could happen because he was so used to controlling the interpretation by yes. his own, his own yes. And I think this is the issue, I think, it's how do you give communities not only cognitive sovereignty, but physical sovereignty, that's the land issue. Yeah, because it's been, the cognitive sovereignty has been appropriated as well as everything else into the dominant culture. Mm. Yeah. It is difficult, I mean, you know, we were talking about Bougainville before and those amazing weapons that, that those genius people made and, uh, uh, you know, took their land back and, and kicked out the mining company and everything else. But um, it was there, you know, was, that sort of was, damage had been done. The, the yeah. um, adjustments had been made mm -hmm. about what is value, what is relation, what is action, what is what is price you know yeah. what is what is being and um unfortunately the experiment that followed um didn't go very well i understand there was a fair bit of interference and sabotage from outside but you know um you know and for but for a while people were um you know hand pressing coconut oil to run the diesel engines on the cars and um, yeah, yeah. All, all kinds of things and setting up amazing like just jerry-rigging up all these little uh, electrical systems and things like that, you know. But in the end, that infrastructure starts to fail. And then people, uh, you know, begin to squabble over the scarce the scarce items that are left. And it didn't end up well from the reports yeah. that I've, I've heard, yeah. but I don't, I, I don't really believe them until I get there. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't and it's still happening. I, I can't speak on it, but things yeah. are still happening, yeah. Yeah. But what I wanted to link that with was the, the way change happens. Sure, Bougainville was uh, a reaction to a desecration of their waters and their land mm. and, and so on, and so they reacted. But uh, I interpreted what you said was, uh, Tyson, about it was there inside each Bougainvillean or Papuan, in, in our case, with some of the mines in, in Millen Bay, where I'm from, there's always there's there's a pride. Uh, I don't know if I'm making this up, whether it's demographic modewa or it's it's sort of something that's innate. But there's a pride, an attitude. It's about history. It's about passion, heart, blood, and it's like you can't put me down. Like mm. I, I'm going to stand up, and it's like you guys, your mob. Nobody you know, boss blame me. Yeah, <laughs> and you guys have been doing it for 250 years, and you're still jump bounce up dust yourself off no one can put you down and you can be as literate and numerate as anyone else so it's that sort of 
well, I don't know how to describe it, but it, and maybe with, and I'm sure with the Welsh as well, you guys, mm. like no, the English or anyone else can't put you down. So it's that attitude. Human but what's, I mean, but there's that, once, once you live in and you inhabit resistance frames for long enough, then that's all you know. True, and the true. moment that relaxes and it's like, all right, well, go on, do your own thing, like self-determine. There's your sovereignty, there's your land, go, go, go. What are you going to do? It's like, oh, hang on, give me a minute. I've just yeah, been, cause, uh, cause we've been, I've just been decolonizing for so long, I, I, exactly. I forgot how to do it. Yeah. 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 Yep. It's worth remembering that the elimination, the attempts to eliminate Welsh indigenous language, um, North American language, yeah, they all took place in about the same 34 year period. I mean, there was sort of accidental stuff building up to it. But the deliberate use of the educational system, like the Welsh not, to eliminate language, that's, that actually parallels very closely, you know, it's like a decade or so apart from the you know, the rabbit proof friends concept and everything else so it's yeah. almost like at that that period from the late 1900s to about <clears> 19, <throat> yeah. there was an active attempt to eliminate native cultures and that included mm. white indigenous as well as other things yeah, yeah. and irish welsh has actually survived better than irish or scottish mm. you know it's funny we got a we we got an apology we had a national apology from the from the government uh, for the stolen generations as an historic thing as a historic thing that happened before. When did it, when did it 1970 something? Yeah, but there are more children right now, Aboriginal children being removed from their families uh, by the government than at the height of the period of the stolen yeah, yeah. generations. Yeah. You know, so we, we have this, this lovely apology. We have this symbolic thing going on and it's like, oh, that's good. That's acknowledged it. Oh, there's, there's been truth. There's been truth and reconciliation. It's, this is the thing that annoys me about um, the kind of group identity stuff that goes on. It, because in the end, the symbolism means more than the, than, than the reality. So as long as we get the symbols right, as long as we get the discourse right, you know, as long as it looks good, as long as the optics are okay, and it looks and feels fair and just, then it's fine. You know, it's I, this I'm illusion really because the structure is still there that is doing all the damage, yes, you know, yes, yes. we're not yes, looking at the structures, we're not looking at the systems, we're looking at the words that come out of mouth, people's mouths, and the, the little metaphors we use. The interactions, the procedures, the processes that have been historically embedded in people's brains in their structures, yeah. Yeah. Confession is becoming a game, but without penance. I mean, nice. it, yeah, so I apologize for something, but I, I mean, confession goes with penance. If you haven't got penance, it's not a confession. So it's the equivalent to saying, look, I stole your house and your land and you're living in a hut at the bottom and that my servant. I'm really sorry for this. Now, would you bring me a cup of tea? Because nothing actually changes. Right. And it, it's 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 a sort of getting rid of guilt without actually accepting the consequences. Yeah. yeah. Look, it's interesting. Someone, we've got a Nora Bateson fan here who keeps like giving giving us Nora Bateson quotes. You know, it's 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 really interesting because Nora, I, I was doing a thing with her once. It was a panel, and I was I was pretty much bullying the whole panel. I must have done at least seventy five percent of all this. T true God, you wouldn't know it to look at me, but I can do this. Um, it was like so. It was three settler or you know what people call white or whatever panelists. And I was just bullied the hell out of them. And they hardly got a chance to speak. And then someone comes in the comments section, you know, oh, look at these three white people oppressing the indigenous person. You know, they should just hear him. You know, why don't they center his voice? Center, I wasn't center, I was the whole thing. You know, but it's amazing just um, what that person saw with the, those filters. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, and then weirdly, um, um, you know, Nora gets cancelled a couple of weeks later from the other side. You know, like, I think they more call it being Dixie checked uh, on that side of politics. But she said something about, you know, um, y you know, the complexity communities, you know, oh, oh, no, it was the integrity theory. No, the integral theory mob and metamodernism. She she said they were all like colonists or something. Like that. It's all just colonial white male stuff. And everybody just mobbed her, you know, poor thing. She's getting it from both sides. Anyway, shout out to Nora. Yeah, two interesting 
of things on that. One is somebody sent me a note after the last dictionary and said, you finally found somebody who talks more than you do. And that was, a, you know, so compliment on that one. Yeah. Um, but we're doing some work with Nora at the moment. All right. So I was part of that attack on step on integral. Oh, sweet. Right. Um, yeah. So it was kind of both of us hit it simultaneously as privileging because the whole point about step changes, theories of change. Yeah. Is it privileges? who considers themselves at the top of the hierarchy it's, it's a yeah. classic control mechanism. you can't just take the um, great chain of being and roll it into a spiral yeah. and go look <laughs> it's not a hierarchy <laughs> anymore but the other big thing Nora and i are about to do a webinar on is to attack the concept of digital democracy right because both are concerned about it because it's an algorithm seeking to be a human being and a Ooh, lot uh, of the new democracy are actually really scary on that it's like a lot of the blockchain stuff because it's reducing human beings to a machine-based transaction yeah you know, which lacks that integration i think that's one of the concerns we've got so there's a webinar coming up on that shortly well you're, you're good mates with jim rutt he, he reckons liquid democracy is the answer uh, to that to uh, <laughs> solve that one and ben, cool, ben gertzel's behind that one too good luck that one. <laughs> yeah, that one the, the, the new guy of Santa Fe Institute who, who said that who, who condemned me and Prigine in the same same sentence as not understanding complexity. So I thought if I'm in the same bracket as Prigine, I'm doing something right. Right. But that was a Jim Rutt show. Either way. <laughs> uh, I love that space. I'm like Forrest Gump in there. No, Borat. I walk around, everyone's very polite, but they're kind of like mm. Beth. So, all this he economics. What about some her economics to finish this up? We've got oh, like I, eight I, minutes. I can, do, I, I can do a poem. I'm Welsh, of course. Ah, oh, please, please um, give us a poem. This might be a wonderful little outro. Um, so, in the beginning, the Lord God Almighty turned to Angel Gabriel and said, Today Not I'm going one. to create a beautiful part of the earth and I will call it Wales. I will make it a country of breathtaking blue lakes, rich green forests and dark, beautiful mountains from which time to time there will be snow covered. I will give it clear, swift rivers that will overflow with salmon and trout. The land shall be lush and fertile on which people can raise cattle and grow their food, as well as being rich with precious metals and stones that will be sought after all over the world. Underneath the land, I shall lay rich seams of coal and inhabitant, uh, for the inhabitants to mine, Around the coast, I will make some of the most beautiful areas in the world, white sandy beaches and cliffs that will attract all manner of wildlife and lots of islands that will be paradise for all of those who visit them. In the waters around the shores, there will be an abundance of sea life. The, one, the, the people who will live there will be called the Welsh and they will be the friendliest people on the earth. They will have all the magic in their blood and songs in their soul. Their voices when raised, in song shall be challenging to even choirs of angels. Excuse me, sir, interrupted Archangel Gabriel. Don't you think that you're being a little bit too generous to these Welsh? The Lord God smiled and replied, you've not seen the neighbours that I'm going to give them. Let's just put the whole thing down to bad neighbours. <laughs> There, there, that's that's geo, geopolitics sorted. Speaking of bad okay. neighbours, speaking of bad neighbours, I I can't really be as poetic as you your Welsh poem, Beth. Uh, so I, I salute you. But there was a uh, a song that was made up by an Australian in Papua New Guinea during the World War. Uh, Second World War about a bad neighbor, about bad neighbors in this case, the Japanese and the Australians fighting in Papua New Guinea. And it goes something like this very briefly. In Papua, we hunted heads. The white and yellow men came and they looked around. Spears and skulls went underground. Uh, from Boona Beach to Mullen Bay uh, and, and to the Kokoda Trail, we drove the enemies far away. I'll leave it at that. Goodness me. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> not as not as poetic as the Welsh, but uh, a contemporary song at the time. Ah. 
You know, it's interesting. I mean, when we do at rugby matches, is we sing hymns. It, it's it's a, it's a particular Welsh, and it comes out of the Welsh chapels. And the fact that people would me on the Saturday and they'd go to the chapel on the Sunday and they'd learn hymns there. And um, my favourite T-shirt, which Beth is envious of because she hasn't got one, so the, the famous Welsh hymn is Bread of Heaven, yeah, which mm. is sung at all churches, and I've got, which is B-R-E-A-D, yeah? I, I've got a T-shirt with B-R-E-D in heaven. That, which mm. is a play on words, right? But mm. that, that choral, I mean, but it's interesting. We then get parodied um, as a land of song, which can yeah. be positive. Yeah. Negative the, co- the, the, call, the call to action, yeah. Yeah. And if you're yeah, like, I, like me, a postman, you have a real problem because people expect you to sing spontaneously over steeds and you're not going to be that cruel to them, right? I, I don't know if people realise that, that singing national anthems before football and rugby matches wasn't a thing. Um, no, we started it. We started New Zealand it. Mary, we were the start first. with the hacker, and, and the, the Welsh team spontaneously came mm. out with the Welsh exactly. national anthem. My hand does not have it. The national anthems at rugby matches start with the Welsh meeting New Zealand. And when, by the way, we beat them by three points in that match. We, we know that. We remember these things. Well, I think we've, we've reached a resolution. I think, I think, uh, I think we've, we've, we've solved our, uh, We've, we've been through all this big thought experiment and I think we've come out the other end with a resolution um, around the question of, um, you know, who can use, a, use another culture's culture for their Halloween costume and, and why does that sometimes go one way and not the other? And, um, well, my takeaway would be it depends on what kind of a neighbour you've been. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd like to, to, to remove the, the discourse around power reductionism, and let's call it good neighbours. Good neighbours. Well, and all Australians will resonate with the concept of neighbours because they inflicted it on us for years. <laughs> Sorry about that. 